right, so the first thing I want to do today is give you all a sample annotated bibliography. So that um, if this is something you've not done before, you know what one is supposed to look like, right? So take a minute, look this over, and let me know if you have any questions about it. This is what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was something I was going to give you, not something you were supposed okay. to give me. Yep. Now I will say that one thing that I did not do in this that I would like all of you to do is I did not include the credentials of the authors of the piece. Um, so I want you to make sure that you are checking up on um, <clears throat> the credentials of each writer, that you, each uh, scholar that you cite, right? Make sure that they have expertise in the relevant area and that they're not regarded by the rest of their field as a wacko. Everything more or less clear? Everything look, did this look like something you can do? All right. Then does anybody have any bigger questions about uh, the assignment or anything we're doing going forward before we get started? So remember, we've got one week right before Thanksgiving break. You'll have one reflection paper due next week, and then one due after the break. And then we're done with the reflection papers, right? There will be one more homework assignment out of writing analytically, and then everything else is just going to be stuff that contributes towards the. In fact, even the, the homework assignment out of writing analytically is something that's going to contribute towards the paper, right? Like you're not going to, it's not going to necessarily go into the paper like the draft will, but um, it'll help you do some thinking that will get you started on the paper. Okay. So, um, have any of you, uh, have either of you read this before? Are any of you familiar at all with, the, with uh, King's Letter? Okay. I've read it multiple years. Okay. I've heard it before this. Okay. I did it for English class last year. Ah. I read a paper on it last year. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of like the key texts in a rhetoric class. Um, because it is, in, um, in many ways, a kind of masterpiece of how to respond to someone else's argument, right? While also broadening that audience out beyond the um, intended recipients of the letter, right? So it's a way to make, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent example of a way to make a public argument for what is essentially a small private audience. Right. 
So um, since you are not entirely unfamiliar with this, and what do you already know about it? Well, about I know also the story like behind it too. But okay. Well, so the story behind it was all sorts of small notes that he kept passing out and that stuff that all came together to be his, what potentially it was letters from Birmingham Jail that all became one big letter. Uh-huh. And it was addressing different issues that were going on in that stuff. And Sure. There was a lot of, like, emotional aspects to the letter. Like, uh -huh. when it comes to, like, pathos, ethos, and logos, there's a lot of, like, emotional stuff within it. Uh-huh. Um, just about human rights. Yeah, he makes a lot of um, yeah he he makes a lot of you know both a, a lot of logical appeals, a lot of emotional appeals, and a lot of appeals to authority, right? Um, and I don't know how much y'all know about the immediate historical context for this, but I want to kind of delve into that a little bit because I think that'll help us make sense of some of the points that he tries to make here, right? So in 1954, the Supreme Court decided in a case known as Brown v. Board of Education that the principle on the legal principle on which segregation in schooling was founded, right? That is that, you know, as long as you maintain equal facilities for students of each race, then they can be separate. That that was in fact unconstitutional. So after 1954, school districts And really, any public educational institutions were ordered to desegregate. And this decision is. Um, where a lot of historians mark the beginning of the late 20th century American civil rights movement uh, because in many parts of the country, really, really in most of the country, um, where de facto segregation existed, if not legal segregation, uh, people were heavily resistant to integrating school districts, right? And this is one thing that I do want to make clear, right? We tend to think about segregation as a solely Southern phenomenon and a solely Southern problem. It was a national phenomenon. It was a national problem. Um, in fact, some of the most intense resistance to school integration was in the Bay Area in California. Um, in fact, I don't know if any of you watched uh, the Democratic presidential debates uh, in 2020, but you may remember that there was a blow up between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris about his resistance to desegregation through busing in the 1970s, right? So that's 20 years on from this, de from this decision, and people were still arguing about this, right? People are still arguing about this. There was intense resistance to this in Boston, right? And this is just, you know, another just kind of quick thing that I want to point out, right? Even in terms of, you know, kind of where slavery had been legal in the United States. Does anybody know where in the U.S. slavery was illegal when the country was founded? That's correct. Slavery was initially legal in all 13 colonies, right? In fact, um, at, the, uh, at the end of the Civil War, there were still slaves in New Jersey, right? So <clears throat> this is a national problem rather than a regional problem. 
right? And I think that that is actually, one, I, I point this out because I think this is one of the things that King is talking about in the letter, right? That this is a national issue. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, Haley. In what state was it that, and I, remember, I don't remember what class this was for, it was in high school. I had to read about the state that there was a couple of schools that out their dances, they still had like separated dances until 01. What's, what was that? Was that Pennsylvania or Virginia? It was one of the two. Uh, Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, um, and I suspect there are probably places that are still, there are probably school districts where that's still the case. Um, it could have been central Pennsylvania. It could also have been somewhere in Virginia. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, yeah, I mean, given like, like, you know, the debates we have over who's allowed to take who to a dance um, and, um, you know, how people are allowed to dress to go to a formal dance and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, this is something that's still a live issue. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't remember where that, I know what the story you're talking about, yeah, but I can't remember where that so was. It was big in the, like, paper and that stuff again, mm -hmm. recently, like, within the last couple of years. Sure. Stuff that was going on and that stuff. Yeah, well, and I mean, de facto school segregation is also still an issue, right, because it kind of tracks de facto residential segregation. Um, but, yeah, so one thing that Brown v. Board, get, Brown v. Board gets the ball, roll, ball rolling on, right, is... Um, a push to desegregate public services more generally, right? So there were still other public services at the time that were, you know, ambul ambulance, public ambulance services were segregated. Uh, you know, public transit was segregated. Um, and public transit was something that civil rights groups in particularly focused on, right? Um, how many of you are familiar with the name Rosa Parks? Do you know who Rosa Parks was? Okay, yeah, who was Rosa Parks? Yeah, she was yeah the uh, the instigator of the Montgomery bus boycotts, right? Which was actually you know, it was a planned out thing between her and several other people. Yeah, she refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white man. And King had been involved in the Montgomery bus boycotts and is a leader then in 1963 of a similar boycott in Birmingham, Alabama. There's an international context for all of this as well. In the mid 20th century, nations in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean that had been colonized by European powers were well into the process of decolonization, right? So, you know, places that have been colonies of Britain or colonies of France were gaining their independence and forming new governments. Uh, so, for example, you know, India uh, declared its independence from Britain in 1947. Um, <clears throat> Kenya declared its uh, independence from Britain in 1965. Right, so you know, these processes are moving along. Even nations that are not yet fully independent are in the process of um, expelling the colonial governments and starting to form their own institutions, right? At the same time that much of this is happening, uh, that the, you know, these civil rights agitations are happening in the United States. So I point this out because this is something that King mentions as well, right? So King, for his part in the boycotts, um, is arrested in Birmingham. And when he is arrested, a group of clergymen, some of whom had been known for their at least moderate support of civil rights legislation, write a letter decrying the boycotts. So what I'd like to do first is look at their letter and see kind of like what we can pull 
thematically out of that and try to figure out exactly what their issue was. And then we'll talk about how King responds to it. So let's call this up. Now let's go through it together. So this is interesting too. Mm -hmm. We, the undersigned clergymen, are among those who in January issued an appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with racial problems in Alabama. We expressed understanding that honest convictions in racial matters could properly be pursued in the courts, but urged that the decisions of those courts should, in the meantime, be peacefully obeyed. Since that time, there had been some evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts. Responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which cause racial friction and unrest. In Birmingham, recent public events have given indication that we all have opportunity for a new constructive and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens directed and, in part, and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized. We are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. Do we notice any patterns emerging even in these first three paragraphs? Any particular patterns of language that reveal something of the thought process or the assumptions that are being made um, about government and about law by the writers of this letter? That it takes time. Okay, yeah. There's an assumption, right, that change is slow. Right? Good. What else? So they're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're trying to demonstrate some level of sympathy and understanding, right? But where do they think the dispute over this should be playing out? In the courts. In the courts, yes. Let the courts handle it. Right, so essentially, Right? Trust the system. And you know, their initial letter, they said, they called an appeal for law and order and common sense, right? So they use words like common sense and realistic and face facts, right? to indicate what about their view of the protests? That's not the right way to go around it, but that. That's a temporary fix, maybe? Well, do they seem to think that it's any kind of fix at all? Yeah, if, if we look at the fact that they're, they're, they're painting themselves as the, you know, holding the position of common sense, of fact, and of reason and realism, what are they suggesting then about the boycotters and the protesters? Pardon? That they should stop and that it's not going to do anything for them. Yeah, that what they're doing is useless and unrealistic, right? We agree, rather, with certain local Negro leadership which has called for honest and open negotiation of racial issues in our area. And we believe this kind of facing of issues can best be accomplished by citizens of our own metropolitan area, 
white and Negro, meeting with their knowledge and experience of the local situation. All of us need to face that responsibility and find proper channels for its accomplishment. Now, what do they add to the argument here? What's their basic problem with King and his group? How are they trying to paint them? As um, inactive. Well, they're a little too active for so their taste. Right? From other areas <laughs> coming to like, protest in other areas, whereas they're not from the yeah. It's not their local. Yeah, area. exactly. Right? They're, they're putting up, they're setting up an insider outsider binary. Right? I thought you meant, um, how is King painting them? Not how are they painting them? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, I picked that up yeah. at first, too. Yeah. Yeah, that these are problems being uh, fomented by outsiders who don't understand how things work in Birmingham, right? But our local black leadership gets it. Just as we formerly pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political tradition, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement officials in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. We further strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. Now, if we think about where they said uh, in the beginning of the letter, these decisions should be made, right? Again, like, what are they assuming here about the way politics works? Where do decisions get made? Who should be making decisions about what happens? The leaders, right? Exactly. Community leaders should be making these decisions, not a bunch of people in the streets, right? The people out in the streets should remain quiet and patient and wait for the leaders to resolve things, right? Yeah, go ahead. Now, did King know their leadership? Like, did he know their leaders and all that? Or did he just come into this with a group of people? Um, well, you know, he actually mentions in the letter that he does know a lot of the local leaders. Okay. And that... Um, I thought so, but yeah. this was just throwing me off where it made it sound yeah. like... So uh huh. Like kind of well, and between both sides of that. they may be talking to different community leaders as well, right? True. Um, you know, the uh, these clergymen, all of whom are white, right, may very well be speaking to different leaders of the black community than King is. It's likely, for example, that the the community leaders that these clergy are talking to are probably you know, better educated and wealthier, for example, um, and thus less willing to upset the status quo. But I think, yeah, the, the key things to get out of this letter, right, are the way these clergy seem to think political power works, right, clearly is a top-down thing rather than a bottom-up thing. Power doesn't come from the people in the streets. Power comes uh, change comes from institutions and from leaders, right? And that we should trust in those institutions and those leaders to do the right thing. Also, that such that, that decisions, even on implementing national laws, should be made locally by local people rather than by outsiders who come in to cause trouble, right? And one thing I also want to note about the signers of this letter, right? is that they represent a diverse um, 
<clears throat> range of Judeo-Christian denominations, right? We have two Catholic bishops at the top, um, a Jewish rabbi, yep, Methodist bishops, um, an Episcopal bishop, a Presbyterian moderator, and a Baptist pastor, right? So this would represent basically, you know, the spectrum of mainstream Christian and Jewish thought in Birmingham at this time, right? So one of the interesting things then that King does at the very beginning of his letter, right, let's look at the way he addresses his audience. What's the very first thing he says here? My dear fellow clergymen. My dear fellow clergymen. Yes. So what's he trying to stress here by addressing the letter to his dear fellow clergymen? Yeah. He's coming at that insider-outsider dichotomy from the very beginning, right? He's trying to break that down even right here. by referring to a group identity that he shares with the signers of this letter, right? We're all clergy. While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all of the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. So he's setting up the argument in this first paragraph, right? What is he doing to address it? First off, how is he making his audience perhaps feel important? He says, I don't have to criticize. Yeah, like normally, like I get so much hate mail and so much criticism that it's not worth my, that it's not worth my time to answer it. But because I think y'all are actually worth talking to and worth having this out with. I'm going to respond to your criticisms in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. Now, why do you think he chooses the words patient and reasonable here specifically? Because they were saying some other things. What's that? They used similar language. Yeah. They use similar language, right? And they're accusing King and his movement of being neither patient nor reasonable, right? So he's trying to demonstrate here from the beginning that no, like actually, I can be an M, patient and reasonable, right? I can speak to you on your terms here. And then the first thing he tries to address after this is the insider outsider issue. Can I get one of you to read uh, for me this uh, paragraph that starts, I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham. Okay. Thank you. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every south, southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some hold on, I lost myself, 85 affiliate organizations all across the South, one being the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Whenever necessary and possible, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Mm -hmm. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we 
lived up to our promise. So I'm here along with several members of my staff because we were invited here. I'm here because I have basic organizational ties here. Okay, thank you. So what's his first response to the outsider accusation? That he is affiliated ties here. Yeah, that in fact his organization has a branch here. So he does have organizational ties to Birmingham, even if he himself is not a resident, right? How else is he responding to this outsider label? what else does he say about this outsider? yeah how else is he responding you know maybe maybe subtly to this outsider accusation that they were called to come and just come but they were fulfilling their promise of coming when needed yeah they didn't just show up they were invited by locals right and if we also look even at the names of the organizations with which, you know, with which he is associated here, right? Southern Christian. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and one of their affiliates is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. So he is stressing um, two kinds of insider identity here, right? One being a Southern identity. and the other being a shared Christian identity, right? That, you know, we may not be from Birmingham, but we are from the same region, and we share a certain set of religious beliefs and assumptions. Can I get one of you to read uh, the paragraph that starts, Beyond this, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Beyond this, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried there, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I am too I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Okay. So what is he what do you notice about the examples he selects here for one thing? They're very biblical based. Yeah. Biblical examples. And how are the two examples slightly different from each other, even though they're both biblical? And here it might help if we think about the different identities of some of the clergy that he's talking to. Um, they're, they're Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah, exactly. He's got one example from the Hebrew Bible, right? And one example from the New Testament. but they're examples that say more or less the same thing, right? How are Paul of Tarsus and the 8th century prophets similar to each other? Yeah. Yeah, they're both called to spread their particular truth, right? To places outside of their hometown, right? So he is trying to demonstrate here that spreading moral teachings beyond your own place of origin is actually part of the tradition that we all claim to be a part of, right? That all these clergy <clears throat> identify with. 
Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere in this country. So where has he taken this I'm not an outsider argument? Like, even just the line that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh-huh. So he's making this as geographically broad as possible, right? If you're American, you can't be an outsider in America. Yeah. And let's kind of parse the justification that he makes for this as well, right? I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. What do you think about this? What, what kind of thinking does this indicate? Or what, what kind of assumption is he making? About what it means to be an insider or an outsider. We are all insiders because we're all affected by it. Yeah, that everything, like, everything I do in my interactions with you, you know, affects you directly in some way. You either learn something in this class or you don't. But things that you learn or don't learn in this class then affect other people around you indirectly, right? There are ripple effects that go out from you in your dealings with others, right? You know, in you know, every class you take, every you know, interaction you have in a store, you know, whatever, right? Um, <clears throat> these all have effects that extend out beyond you. So everybody is tied together, according to King, in this kind of larger social fabric. And in order to build a peaceful, harmonious society, right, you have to be treating everybody with fairness and with justice. You have to be treating everybody as a fully fledged person and not as a thing, to go back to the Martin Buber, I, thou, I, it thing. That what happens to us individually is dependent in large part on what's happening around us in context. All right, so insider-outsider argument largely taken care of, right? He's made a pretty effective demonstration that he is in various ways an insider here. Now the other major argument that they're making against him is that he is hasty and impatient, right? And unreasonable, pushing for change too quickly. Oh, one other thing I want to go back to for a second. We're talking about this kind of network of mutuality, right? What does that then suggest that King believes about where political power is located? Would he agree with these clergy that it's located in institutions and in authority? Sure. Yeah. King is assuming that political power is shared amongst the people, right?
right? It's distributed rather than top down. Can I get somebody to read the paragraph for us? It starts with, you deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham. You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham. But I'm sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the de demonstrations into being. I am sure that each of you would want to go beyond the superficial social analyst who looks merely at effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. I would not hesitate to say that it is unfortunate that so-called demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham at this time. But I would say in more emph emphatic? emphatic emphatic terms that it is more unfortunate that the white power structure of this city left the Negro community with no other alternative. Okay, so what is he suggesting that these clergy he's responding to have confused in their analysis of the situation? What have they missed, or what are they not understanding? Um, wait, again. What does he seem to think that these clergy he's responding to don't understand in their analysis of their situation? What does he think they've missed, or what does he think they're mixing up? Like where he says, your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being, like that kind of thing? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. that kind what's, of thing. What's, yeah. worse, what's worse in the situation? Okay. I think he's also talking about it as a sort of like cause and effect mm -hmm. situation here, right? That they're only focused on the effects and they're not looking at the underlying causes. Right. You're bothered that there are people out in the streets making noise and, you know, disrupting public transit. But you're not looking into why they're doing it. Right? You're not thinking about what led to this. And that's the essential element he thinks that they're missing, right? That this isn't just people acting wacky for no reason. Right. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. One, collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. Two, negotiation, self-purification. Uh, three, self-purification. And four, direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. So with this list here, he's trying to demonstrate that no, we did do careful planning. right? that this wasn't random, this wasn't thoughtless. We understand what we're doing, there's a process to this, and we followed it. And then the next several paragraphs kind of outlay how they followed this process, right? And um, I want to focus on this next paragraph because I think it points to one of the failures that he sees in the approach advocated by the other letter writers, right? Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than any city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. So what happened when they tried the style of politics that these other clergy prefer? They engaged. Yeah. The city, the, the city lead, the elected city leaders would not engage with the community's black leadership, right? 
So negotiations between white and black community leaders led to not like didn't happen, right? Negotiation requires two sides willing to talk to each other. And if we skip ahead to page 353, we see what you may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, etc.? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue so it can no longer be ignored. I just referred to the creation of tension as a part of the work of the nonviolent resistor. This may sound rather shocking, but I must convince, confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of the direct action is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. We therefore con concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in the tragic attempt to live in monologue rather than dialogue. So, <clears throat> the purpose of direct action is what? Negotiation. Yeah, that's what you're trying to get to, right? And so what he's trying to point out is that you don't get to negotiate unless you put pressure on people who don't want to negotiate with you, right? You have to make things difficult for them so that they're willing to sit down and talk, right? That nothing productive arises without tension, right? Tension is the force that drives change. not complacent waiting around. Now, why do you think he uses the example of Socrates here specifically? As a social gadfly. Yes, Socrates' opinions were unpopular, for one thing, and he freely expressed them. And what happened to Socrates as a result of this free expression of unpopular opinions? Yeah, so on the one hand, we've got a guy who's a kind of free speech martyr, right? But I think that Socrates' method is also important in King's illusion here, right? So let's think back again to, like, uh, to, the, to Socrates' method versus Gorgias' method, right? What was Gorgias's basic belief? About reality and about language. That it can be taught, but you can't blame the teacher for what the student does. Okay, yeah, you can't blame the teacher for what the student does with the tool, right? And also, right, that we can't really know truth, right? Yeah. And the best we can do is kind of make speeches that influence people to follow a particular course of action. Whereas Socrates, Socrates and his disciple Plato said, bullshit, there is absolute objective truth, and we get, we get to it 
not through monologuing at people or simply persuading people, but through discussion, right? That whole model of dialectic, right? This notion of finding truth through mutual discussion. So the allusion to Socrates here has a couple of layers to it, right? Free speech martyr and somebody who believed in negotiation as the way to truth. But you had to bug people a little bit before they'd negotiate with you. So, <clears throat> The writers of the other letter also argue that change is slow, right? Or that it ought to be slow. And you ought to be patient. How does King seem to feel about the idea of patiently waiting for change to happen? He said, I think he said something like, time is neutral. OK, yeah. So there's always, I mean, it's always the time to act. Change uh huh. Um, yeah, time has no particular values, right? Time doesn't care what you think or what you feel or what you believe. It just passes, right? Now, <clears throat> there's a common notion of historical change. It's something that becomes popular first in England in the 19th century and then uh, kind of gets married to the American um, idea of progress. Um, it's called either the myth of progress or the Whig theory of history, right? After the um, political party in Britain with whom it was most associated. Um, are, either, are, there, are either of you familiar with any of these terms? Or can you at least kind of guess uh, what they mean when they refer to is it history like, as a process. Is it like a, um, like, I don't know, like a progression like the government makes it seem like stuff is actually progressing, but it's not? Or is it not political? It's not, well, it is political, but not in the, not in the way that you're thinking. It's political in that it kind of does encourage people to be complacent. Right? It does encourage a particular set of values. What is complacent? Complacent means eh, you're, just, you're kind of OK with things as they are, and you really don't want to rock the boat, right? So what these two theories of history say, or what this, it's actually one theory of history with two names. What they say is that everything gets better over time, right? That history only moves forward, and that what we have now in the present is better than what our ancestors had in the past. And what our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will have will be better than what we have, because things only improve. Now, all we have to do is study history a little bit, right? To take that particular theory apart and to call bullshit on it. But it's nonetheless like a very popular and pervasive way of thinking, right? We tend to think of ourselves with no real basis for doing so as being better off, you know, than say the ancient Egyptians. Um, when there, you know, there are ways in which the ancient Egyptians, you know, may have had uh, certain things better than we do. But yeah, we assume, we assume when we think this way that our historical era is kind of like the pinnacle of development up to this point, and that things are only going to get better from here, right? And that we don't really have to do anything about it, it just happens. That's the kind of thinking that King is accusing these clergy of being engaged in, right? 
this kind of thing. Yeah, just wait and things will get better, right? And what he does to counter this is try to make the experience of people who have to wait for things to get better concrete, right? We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed, according to the timetable, of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. It has been a tranquilizing thalidomide, relieving the emotional stress for a moment, only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence, and we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. So this is why I pointed, by the way, to that other context that we're talking about, the mid-20th century decolonization um, of nations in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. Uh, <clears throat> He's talking about that here. These other countries are moving very, very quickly towards declaring their independence from European powers. And people who look like me, he's saying, can't even sit at a lunch counter without getting arrested. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find yourself tongue-twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children, and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky, and see her begin to distort her personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness towards white people, when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking an agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? So can you see what he's doing here? He's putting in a lot of pathos. <laughs> yeah, he's putting in a lot of pathos, right? And. Let's maybe think about this in terms of moral and ethical philosophy we've already talked about, right? What is he trying to put in concrete terms here? Like the unfairness of it all, the uh -huh. major downside to not just the like adults, but like to their kids who are being raised in this issue where they're yeah. gaining that bitterness and okay, yeah, towards white people. Yeah, he's pointing out that it's generational, right? and that this does actually have an effect on white people as well. And is he pointing this out to people who have ever had to experience this? Yeah, he's pointing out the problem. What's that? He's pointing out like the effect, yeah. Yeah, he's people who have it. Exactly, yeah, he's, tr he's trying to paint an imaginative picture here, right? For people who have never had to directly experience this. So what he's trying to do is that kind of Adam Smith style moral sympathy. You know, if, if, you know, if I can make this concrete for you, and I can get you to imagine what it's like for me, right? And what it's like for people who are more like me than they are like you. Maybe you'll try to see it from our side instead of y'all. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's about trying to get someone to imagine things from a different direction, right? From a different perspective. And I think that this uh, speaks to, uh, if we go to page 357, his complaints 
about the person he refers to as the white monitor. All right, can I get somebody to read, um, starting from first, I must confess that over the last few years, in the middle of page 357. Okay. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have also, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you see, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set a timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and who constantly and who constantly advised the Negroes to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Okay, thank you. So how is he here speaking directly to the terms of that initial letter? He says, I agree with your goal, but don't condone your actions. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's the, the gist of their letter, right? Mm -hmm. But he's also using a lot of their, he's throwing a lot of their language back at them, right? Yeah. Right, remember that, you know, their initial letter was a call for law and order and common sense, right? So what does he say here about the person who prefers order? What does he oppose order to? Yeah. Right, that order isn't necessarily justice. Where else does he seem to be um, speaking directly to their terms? Okay. What did you just write there? Absence of tension versus presence of justice. Now there's another theme that we haven't really um, pulled out of this too much, just that we just haven't had time to, but I also want to point to the use of the word paternalistically here. What does it mean to behave paternalistically to someone? As a father. Yeah, as a father or a parent, right? As though you're kind of taking someone's um, you're kind of taking someone's uh, life and rights into your hands, right, and deciding for them uh, when, <clears throat> you know, what's good for them, right? And um, he had, like, we didn't pull this part out of that, uh, the long paragraph of pathos that we talked about, mm -hmm. but he also, you know, talks about, you know, how, you know, being referred to, you know, he's a man in his 30s, and people still call it, like a lot of white people still call him boy, right? So there's a theme here as well of infantilizing. And patronizing behavior on the part of white people towards black people. That um, <clears throat> is probably worth pulling out. Um, though we don't, we, we don't really have the time to do that right now. But yeah, he talks also here about the myth of time. And how these people with whom he's arguing subscribe to this mythical notion of progress, right? 
And I mean, what's what does somebody get from subscribing to this notion of progress? Right? Why is it comforting to believe in this myth of time or this myth of progress? Yeah, it makes you feel good about what you have, right? And if things get better with simply with the passage of time, do you actually need to do anything to improve anything? No, yeah, you can just sit on your ass and reap the benefits, right? So yeah, this this is like like it's a very kind of self-satisfied kind of way about thinking of history, right? That, you know, things are going to get better no matter what I do, just with the passage of time, so why should I do anything? All right. Um, now, last thing I want to point to, there's a particular image um, just kind of running out of time here that uh, King points to that I particularly like. Uh, if we look on page 361, um, can I get one of you to read the paragraph that starts with, um, I had the strange feeling when I was suddenly catapulted? I had the strange feeling when I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery several years ago that we would have the support of the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be some of our strongest allies. Instead, we have been outright oppon opponents, mm -hmm. refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anest anesthetizing. anesthetizing security of the stained glass windows. Now let's think about the image here he paints of the stained glass windows of the church, right? What do we know about a stained glass window? There's many pieces soldered together to make a hole. Okay, and the other one that's you have fragments that make a hole. They usually depict stories. Yeah, they often depict uh, stories from the Bible, from the lives of saints, right? So there's often a kind of religious narrative. But what's the major difference between a stained glass window and, say, a window like that? Oh, you can't see it. Yeah. It's also opaque, right? I was about to say that they were all different, but... Uh-huh. They are, right? Yeah, but I think... I think the major thing that King, like the major, the central point of King's image here, the stained glass window, is that it's opaque, right? That you can't see through it into the outside, and somebody looking into your church from outside can't see in through the stained glass window, right? It's decorative, it's pretty, but it protects you and insulates you from what's going on outside. And I think that this is somehow related to that insider-outsider binary that he uh, <clears throat> is dealing with from the beginning, right? That instead of him kind of like being the outsider, what you, know, what you all are doing is in fact simply closing yourselves off into a smaller and smaller definition of what's inside and not looking beyond the walls of your own church. All right, so that's about all I have for you. Like, does anybody have any questions or comments about anything? I think he was also using, sometimes people call themselves Christian because it makes them think that they're better. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I think there, there is a lot of that about not living your values, right? Um, you know, particularly you know, when he talks about how, um, you know, the power of the early church, for example, when the church was powerful was when it was actually weak in numbers and socially excluded. 
Um, like that was when it actually had the power to create tension. All right, so once again, I seem to have brought the wrong flash drive, so I'll give you the, I'll give you the reading questions for Roger Lord uh, over email. And uh, yeah, have yourselves a good weekend. We'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you too.